All our brothers.
Good evening, everyone. Let's extol uh, the name of our Lord together. I welcome you all for uh, this evening uh, to, to the program because of Bethlehem, a Christmas uh, play by our Hilltop Sunday School children. We have a Savior who came down from the heights of the heaven because he saw our story, right? And um, he didn't come as a messenger. He came down with a message of hope, right? So as we proceed our program, let us sit in his presence with prayerful heart as we uh, see uh, what our children are going to present this evening in our midst. So let us uh, give thanks to the Lord for this wonderful evening. May his name alone be glorified. Now I request uh, Brother Lijo to open this uh, evening with a word of prayer, followed by a song by our dear kindergarten children. Let us pray. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful time that you've given us, O oh Father, to remember the greatest gift that heaven has given to mankind, O oh Father, and we thank you, O oh Father, that it was your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we, uh, as we remember the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, and as every program uh, goes on this evening, O oh Father, we pray that this would be a time where your name would be glorified, O oh Father. And Lord, if there's anybody seated here who have never had an experience of experiencing the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in their personal life, O oh Father, we pray that this day, uh, it would be a day of transformation in their lives as well, so that they would also be able to enjoy the joy and the peace and the love that we are experiencing from you, O oh Father. And Father, we pray that you would be with these little children as they do all these programs for thy glory, O oh Father. Take glory in everything, and we humble ourselves in your presence. Forgive us of all our shortcomings in Jesus Christ's precious name we pray. Amen.
We are set to revisit a summary of a true story. It is like many other good stories you've read or heard, but the more you grasp, this is not just another story. It is the story. It defines us all. It makes us think about who we are and who we can become. And so, this story begins with God, who has always been. He has always existed, and he has always existed exactly as he is now. If it seems confusing, it's because he's beyond what anyone can fully comprehend. In the beginning, God spoke, and everything came into existence. By his command, the entire universe was created and filled with a dramatic display of galaxies, stars, and planets, including Earth, on which was a perfect garden of paradise called Eden. Out of all the beauty God created, his greatest masterpiece was a man and a woman. God created Adam and Eve in his own image to reflect him. Adam and Eve were created with the grand purpose of worshiping him by loving him, serving him, and enjoying a relationship with him. Considering our world today, it's obvious that perfect peace didn't last. Turmoil, war, sickness, troubles, we each have our share. Yes, something tragic happened. That reflection was marred by sin when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Yeah. 
Sin and suffering and pain were passed down from generation to generation, and all of creation was distorted from its original design. Everyone has sinned, and the ultimate consequence is an internal separation from a loving God. Can anything be done? Is there any hope? Yes, the love that prompted God to create us also prompted him to who would set everything right again. Yes, life. Almost two thousand years ago, Jesus came to earth and God, the Son, to fulfill the promise. This demonstrates God's infinite knowledge and power and capability to foretell the future with perfect precision and to bring it to pass. He was born miraculously with one. In God's plan, general history becomes redemptive history. The events by which God <clears throat> arranges to redeem his people from sin by coming of Jesus, a child in a cradle to a king on the cross. He He's, he carried the weight of all our sins and rescued us from the effects of the fall. Jesus is our Savior. God has given us history and prophecy that is dog our memories. From Old Testament, from Genesis to Revelation. As we flip to God's history manual, we can hear and feel for in his concern and know the assurance of justice in his judgment. He will have been in the world, but God offers hope, and he will remember his good, his words to press on in holiness, but hope and confidence. Time and 
time again You have proven You do just what you say Though the storms may come And the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn When you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness To God allowed humankind to continue, and with that, the promise continued that one day, the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. During the time of Noah, sin enveloped the whole world. God was grieved he made mankind because they filled his heart with pain. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man and blameless among the people of his time. And he walked with God. The Lord shut Noah in because he demonstrated his faith by building the ark. God always has his righteous and devout people, even in the darkest times. God never leaves himself entirely without a witness. This makes us believe that grace can live 
and flourish even in the most unfavorable circumstances. And then establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. This points us to a hope that God is merciful and that he remembers his people and lead them with his promises that he will one day defeat the evil. We know for sure on this side of heaven that it is impossible for your human mind to fully comprehend God's infinite and awe-inspiring nature. He is the great I am, the only one who is perfectly self-sufficient, who has no beginning, no end, or any limits. In a world that is constantly changing, He is our constant. His knowledge encompasses every possible piece of information regarding anything that currently exists, has existed in the past, or will exist in the future. He is all-sufficient, all-bountiful, and is the perfect embodiment of goodness. tapestry of God's divine plan for deliverance, woven through the ages, from preserving the world in Noah's time to initiating redemption through Abraham, establishing the Nishra of Israel with Moses, promising an eternal shepherd king in David, until finally fulfilling all to the majestic arrival of Jesus. Each covenant, a brilliant stroke, revealing God's unwavering promise to save us through the seed of the woman, culminating in the undeniable truth. 
Redemption finds its ultimate fulfillment solely in King Jesus. As we read the genealogy of Jesus Christ and consider the people mentioned in his lineage, we learn from this long list that different types of people were used so that God's beloved son could come to earth, whether a righteous prophet, an imperfect leader, an unknown helper, or someone with a questionable background or reputation, all are known to the Lord. No matter our status, background, or station in life, we too can have our name added to the long, beautiful list of those who play a critical role in gathering Israel.
Abraham, Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. So shall your offspring be. those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you Sarah take me by my arm to Westward sails the golden sun, and Hebron's hills are amber crowned. Long after we are dead and gone, for a thousand years our tale be sung. Okay. 
Jacob's prophecy foreshadows the future coming king of Israel from Judah. Joseph's story is not just about God's providence, but it's also about his promises. God uses Joseph to turn back the effects of the curse and accomplish in part. Joseph's story, his promises to Abraham, was by bringing back the Hebrew people into his will and his purpose. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's children shall bow down before you. Joseph's story is a story of the whole Bible. It's a story of glory through suffering, exaltation through humiliation. It's a story of cross and crown. Moses, Moses, here I am. 
Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place you stand is a holy ground. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am sent me to you. to look in the mirror without hiding my eyes I'd like to see what you see where you think I'm qualified to speak for you oh God most high who hides a baby in the reeds of a him a stage and the strength to deliver his people cause I'm tongue tied weak in the knees must be something you wanna see if there's anything good anything that's good in me well it must be you By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. God delivers Moses from the water. He was adopted and raised in the royal household. At the age of 40, he had to choose between power, influence, wealth, 
and the glory of Egypt and the slavery of his own people. Moses' decision challenged and changed his life, leading him to a 40-year period of wilderness wanderings. This drastic change from the royal courts of Pharaoh to just a common herdsman leading another man's flock was God's plan of a divine stripping to equip a man he was going to use for the deliverance of his people and to mold him for a task that only God's wisdom could accomplish through him. A leader dare not challenge God's process of calling and preparation. The fear and belief Moses showed was answered by God through signs, by illustrating natural into supernatural and normal into miraculous, therefore showing that the most common things in the hands of men become opportunities for the Lord to show forth his power when they submit to his power. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people. To the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Be strong and of good courage, for to these people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. An amazing truth is now engraved on Joshua's mind at this point. God's workers die, 
but God's work never dies. And Joshua is now the chosen man, the God-picked man, the man who will now shepherd, lead, guide, and fight for the people of Israel. Joshua, he led with courage, he led with the word, and he followed God. Through Joshua, God fulfilled his promise to give the land of Canaan to Jacob's descendants. Joshua portrays the Lord as the general, the one who will lead his people in a victorious battle, if they trust and obey. God's promises were fulfilled throughout the ages, right before the people rise. Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel. All came to pass. The nation of Israel was fractured after the death of Joshua, and an other generation arose who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for them. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Baals, and forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, and it provoked the Lord to anger. The cycle looks like this. The children of Israel do evil in the sight of the Lord. God sends a foreign power to oppress them. The people cry out to the Lord, and God sends a judge who delivers them. The land has rest, and then the cycle repeats. God is jealous for his people and patient with his people, and he does not want them to worship other gods. God was faithful to the covenant relationship, even when the people of Israel were not faithful. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. When 
when famine struck the land of Judah, the family of Elimelech went to dwell in the country of Moab. But when the head of the family dies, and so do the two sons after a few years, the mother-in-law Naomi is left all alone with her daughter-in-law Ruth, a Moabite who chose not to leave Naomi. We can see God's sovereign plan guide through all these events. From Ruth and Naomi's tough times and losses to Boaz's redemption of Ruth, we can see God at work. Ultimately, the story of Ruth points to Christ and his gospel and reveals to us how God works together for good to those who love him. The promised Messiah, Savior of the world, through this unlikely couple, Ruth and Boaz, brought together by the sovereign hand of God in order to accomplish his divine plan. Ruth and Boaz's son was Obed, Obed father Jesse, and Jesse's son was David. Amazing are the ways of the Almighty. God's acts are accomplished through his infinite wisdom. Our good and his glory are totally bound together. He is wisdom personified. 
He is the Alpha and the Omega and every moment in between. God is at work in our lives and in our world. The Lord is my banner, and under his banner he leads his children from tribe to tribe. Out of his faithfulness, God honors his covenant and fulfills his promises. Our hope for the future rests upon God's faithfulness. Israel wanted a king like the other nations, so the Lord told Samuel to appoint them a king. The people chose Saul as their king, but God rejected him as king. It was time for God to intervene and put his man on the throne. will know that Israel has a God. It never was about the oil dripping from my I never did dream beyond the pastures I could tend It never was about the praise, not about the street parade I didn't really need a crowd when Goliath fell down I never meant to work here with simple shepherd song Just see. 
God established David as king of Israel and blessed him to secure a stable and peaceful rule. God um, promised David uh, to build David a house and that he would make his name great and that he would preserve his royal line until a final descendant would come and restore his kingdom forever. On the brink of exile and disaster, when the people of Israel had sunk to their lowest, God promised prophecies of deliverance through his prophets. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall, co- shall conceive and bo- bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over all his kingdoms, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. servant of the living God. How's your God whom you serve continually being able to deliver you from the lions? My God sent his angel and shut the lions mouths so that they have not hurt me. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions.
Fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Daniel had dreams that dramatically outlined God's future plans. Some of them happened in his lifetime, and others came true in history. But there is one that still remains. His dreams gave a preview of God's redemptive story, and absolutely points to Jesus as Savior. The story of Daniel is a story of God's glory and God's providence for his people. God constantly demonstrates his glory through Daniel, making his name known among the Babylonian kings revealing the limits of their power. God preserved Daniel in the lion's den when King Darius was powerless to do so. The God-honoring convictions, civility, faithfulness, and excellence of Daniel and his friends was a witness to God and also to a watching world. Daniel prophesied about hope for all mankind in the future reign of one like the Son of Man, his Son, Jesus Christ, whose kingdom shall not be destroyed. Some of those visions he was not permitted to write down, but instead he was told to seal up the vision. Everything God does. Everything God does in the lives of his people is grounded in and governed by his steadfast, loyal, unchanging love and is true evidence of God's oversight of history. against the law. If I perish, I perish. Deliver! 
Esther belonged to the period after the Babylonian exile, when Persia replaced Babylon as the ruling power. Her story is all about how a Jewish woman became the queen of Persia and how God used her to protect and propel his plan for his people and to set the stage up for redemption. Esther saves her people from a plot to destroy them. She puts her position of royalty on the line so that she could save her people. And through her actions, she not only preserved the Jewish nation in general, but she also preserved the line of David, in particular from whom the Messiah would come. A profound theme through. A profound theme throughout the scriptures is the awe-inspiring ways in which God, in His boundless wisdom and sovereignty, exalts the most unexpected and unlikely individuals as instruments to manifest His magnificent glory. Israel was oppressed uh, both politically and more importantly spiritually. This was a dark time in the nation of Israel. They earnestly longed for their Messiah, their hope of deliverance. Silent decades, generation and centuries, 400 years of silence. It began with the prediction of Malachi, of coming of John the Baptist. Despite a lack of much scripture detailing, a great deal happened. Many Jews had returned from the meadow, Persian Empire and the rebuild of temple, experiencing the moderate level or revival under the influence of Ezra. But they still did not live as God had instructed them. The priests neglected the temple and their responsibility to teach God's laws. Many prophecies were fulfilled. Significantly, one of Daniel's which spoke of coming of John, uh, of coming of the Greek and the Romans. Though there were no fresh revelation from the prophets, God had not forgotten his people. He is at work making necessary changes in the rule of the land and set stage for his plans.
your people are home So long, Moses Hello, Joshua Goodbye, Canaanites We're coming to town Twelve tribes and no crown No crown, oh Lord But we want a king on a throne Full of power With his sword in his fist Will there ever be Will there ever be a king like this? First king of Israel, you were foolish and strong, so you didn't last long. Goodbye, Saul.
See that star? It's shining so bright. We have never seen anything like this ever before. Look at that. It's so bright and it hasn't moved a bit. Let's continue studying it. I think there's something significant about it. There must be a scroll about it somewhere. Yeah, here it is. The appearance of a star gives us the message that a child who had been born would be a king. A king? We must find this child who is worthy of worship and gifts. How can this be? How? Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word.
For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you on this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn.
shepherds? It sounds like you've had a very exhausting journey. Look at him. He's just a baby. Yes, his name is Jesus, and he's the one we've been waiting for. Upon seeing the star, the Magi rejoiced exceeding with joy. The star went before them until it reached their final destination. Our Heavenly Father had us in mind and set us the treasure of heaven. Christ, the joy of the Father, entered in and became a Savior. A Savior, meek and mild. Now that's the mystery. 
that was revealed to his servants, which was hidden in ages in God. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by the angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is Jesus, King of glory, here to rescue from the foe. Son of God, who comes to save us, Prince of Peace and Lord of all. story of Jesus Christ. Our Creator God expanded His divine role to become our Savior and our Redeemer. This is love. Who embraced humility that it might become our story too? By embracing the story of perfect and divine love by faith. Christmas is also not just about the physical blessings of people and presents. But these are the shadow of the greatest gift we have ever got. Jesus, his birth, his death, and his resurrection, and his indwelling life is the greatest gift of Christmas. So let's celebrate our true inheritance, fulfilled through Christ by adopting into God's family by faith in Christ. One day he will be coming with fire in his eyes to ransom his own and lead us straight to glory, to reign with him forevermore. That's our hope. From a tomb that love left empty to a father's right hand throne and the promise he's preparing us a place we'll soon call home. He who came to earth from heaven is coming back again. And our eyes will see eternity because of Bethlehem. This Christmas season, as recipients of his mercy and grace, May we be challenged to proclaim his excellencies to the other ushering people out of darkness into the light of Christ. Because of a wonderful job children may god's name may be glorified i request uh, brother stephen george to come forward to and to share the word of god stephen george good 
Hello, check. I guess before I start, why don't we just give them another big round of applause? <laughs> You know, this takes a lot of effort to put together, all the way from late nights in music, uh, decorations, overall coordination, skit practice, and much more. And all of this for what, exactly? Why are they doing all of this? To remind us of a story, of a story of Bethlehem, the story of a baby boy named Jesus, and that's the reason why they were putting all this effort together. You know, I always get really, I don't know if this is the right word, but sad for the speaker who speaks on uh, the Christmas program because the kids do a fantastic job in covering the whole story from A to Z, and there's literally nothing left for me to say. So, um, you know, it's, not, it's nothing different for me as well uh, as I come up on here. Uh, here. Uh, myself not really sure what's left to say but you know before i start i guess let me ask a question to the audience and if you don't know the answer to this we'll have to speak after church so it's a simple question and the question is where was jesus born what was the name of the place someone said mississauga who said that <laughs> right I, I also heard bethlehem which is the right answer right because of bethlehem that's the theme of today's program, as you all may know. And I was thinking, with this theme, because of Bethlehem, what exactly should I be saying? And one of the stories that came to my mind was the story of Gloria Gaither. And that's a story that I would like to share with you today. Gloria Gaither, as many of you may know, is a famous songwriter. We, we actually sing many of her songs in our assemblies. Now, she was about to have her third child. And during that stage of her life, she said that she was going through a lot of difficult times. Her husband, Bill Gaither, um, had, had a disease that made him very physically weak. And on top of that, they were going through a lot of family problems. She also said that her country was being ripped apart because of discrimination because of the effects of the Vietnam War in 1960s, and also because of the education system that was not teaching about the birth of Christ, but rather was teaching that God is dead. And so as she saw all of this take, take place around her, and as she was preparing for her third child, she asked this one question that I would like to bring to your attention today. And the question she asked was, how could someone bring a baby into this world? And that's, that's what I would like to bring to your attention. Who would bring another baby into this world was her question as she was preparing for her third child. You see, when she asked this question, she admitted that circumstances dictated, dictated her life. And if this mother fed like this, I was just wondering... How would have Mary felt given all the circumstances that she went through? And some of that we saw this evening. She just got told by Angel Gabriel that she would give birth to the Messiah, the King. In Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, it says, Angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed, and the virgin's name was Mary. Also reading verses 31 and 32, the angel says, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. So Mary just found out who exactly she is giving birth to. And her first reaction was, How will this be? Since I am a virgin, and this is where Mary learned her first lesson. With God, nothing is impossible. And I hope this is a lesson that we leave from here as well. With God, nothing is impossible. 
the angel told her, the Holy Spirit will be on you. The Most High will overshadow you. And the angel also told her, look at your relative Elizabeth. The one who is barren is, has now conceived our son in her old age. And the angel also said one final thing in response to her reaction. A few simple words. He says in Luke chapter 1 verse 37. Luke chapter 1 verse 37 says, For nothing will be impossible with God. Let me repeat that. For nothing will be impossible with God. Those few simple words turned into a simple faith and caused a drastically new reaction in Mary. A reaction where it was one of humbleness, belief, submission, and praise. And let's see where we see that. We'll look at some passages in Luke chapter 1. And Mary says, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it, let it be to me according to your word. And this is something that we heard on the stage as well. Here we see Mary's humbleness and submission. And Elizabeth says of Mary, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Here you see Mary's belief. And finally, we see Mary bursting out into a song of praise, saying, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers through Abraham and to his offspring forever. Humbleness, belief, submission, and, prayer, and praise was a result of Mary realizing that God is in control and that all things are possible with him. Coming back to the story of Gloria Gaither, after she asked the question, who would bring another baby into this world? She had a close friend come by, lay his hands on her and pray for her. And that's when she had the same realization that Mary had, that God is in control and nothing is impossible, with, uh, nothing is impossible for him. And that simple realization led to a simple faith, which then led to humbleness, belief, submission, and the beautiful song that we all love to sing to today, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. When I see this theme, because of Bethlehem, I am reminded that circumstances do not dictate life. The Lord does. Because if circumstances, uh, if, because if it was up to circumstances, then how could someone be, bo be born of a virgin, let alone a king? But not only that, in Micah chapter 5 verse 2, it says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Bethlehem was considered a little insignificant place among all the other cities of Judah. Yet, a king was supposed to come from there. How? Luke chapter 2 verse 7 says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. How can a king be laid in a manger? A place where it was for animals just because they could not find a room. How? Looking at all these circumstances, can anyone say that Bethlehem would produce the ruler of all? the King of kings, the Lord of lords, that these circumstances would produce a baby that would make the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the dead to live again, and the lame to leap and the dumb to speak? Can anyone fathom that the Lord of all creation would be born in these circumstances? And surprisingly or not, the answer to all these questions is a resounding yes, only if God is in control. So, 
my question to you is, what is your reaction today as you remember the birth of this baby boy? What is your reaction today when you hear, because of Bethlehem? Is it one of despair or one of hope? Because God is in control and nothing is impossible with Him. Is it one of fear or is it a simple faith that leads to humbleness, belief, submission, and praise? I like how a songwriter puts a question for Mary, just like she was standing right in front of him, waiting to answer it. The question that the songwriter asks is, Mary, did you know that the child you delivered is soon going to deliver you? And that's my question to anyone sitting here who has not accepted Christ as their personal Savior. Did you know that this child that we've been talking about all this evening is able to deliver you? From what you ask? There's one circumstance, circumstance that I haven't talked about this evening yet. And that circumstance is sin. It is a circumstance that you got into very easily, but you cannot do anything to get out of. This circumstance destined us to, to death and eternal separation from God. But all hope is not lost. Because this baby boy, this child named Jesus, became that perfect sacrifice for us who volunteered himself to take our place on that cross so that we don't have to. And through him, we have eternal salvation and are no longer condemned to death. God is in control from birth to his life on this earth, and even in his death and resurrection, God is in control. Circumstances cannot alter his promises. His promise of being born of a virgin, his promise of being born in a manger, in a lowly city, and even his promise of defeating sin. All of them he has fulfilled, and he makes one more promise with us tonight. For those who know him as his personal savior, he has promised that he is going to prepare a place for us, that he will come back again and take us with him where he will be also. And that is a promise that we have tonight. Because of Bethlehem, we have hope. Because of Bethlehem, a great divide has been bridged where we now have access to God himself through Christ Jesus. Let us continue to be in his presence with all humbleness, belief, submission, and praise. May the Lord's name be glorified. Thank you, Stephen. That was an uh, encouraging, wonderful thought. Now I request all uh, dear children to come for the uh, final song. And uh, I would request the teachers and the volunteers to also join in this last song.
I think the teachers are a little shy to come. Yeah, please, all the teachers, yeah, and the volunteers. Yeah, they're there.
So we have come to the end of the program and uh, I'll be praying and closing. I'm sure that what we witnessed here uh, has delivered a great message to all of us. And what we saw in uh, two and a half hours certainly has required weeks of practice. We know that. And our children, has, children have done a good job. Their performance, their um, delivery, everything was so marvelous. They certainly deserve a big appreciation. Also, the Sunday school teachers and uh, the principal, Brother Ashley Titus, they all deserve a big appreciation for such a great presentation. And uh, also I want to thank uh, Stephen George who gave us a very meaningful message in uh, connection to today's presentation. Uh, let's pray and close this meeting and uh, we have a dinner prepared for everyone. So after the prayer, we'll go to the basement and we will enjoy the dinner. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you God for uh, bringing all of us here safely this evening and helping us to witness uh, the presentation uh, of our children. God, we are so amazed to see that what, uh, how much talent is filled in our children and they are willing to use that talent for your glory. They have uh, done a marvelous job and they have given us a great message this evening that the good news of salvation was not just given in, in a moment, it was given from the very beginning of creation. And the children walked us through uh, all the major events that led to the appearance of the Savior or the Son of God into this world. And we are truly thankful, God, that you have prepared such a great salvation and you have been sending messengers after messengers to give the message that a Savior is coming. And finally, that Savior appeared in Bethlehem. And today we believe in him and we are delivered. We are saved. We thank you for that. So thank you for all this great presentation and also the message that we have received. Help us to be inspired and encouraged by what we saw this evening. Now we are going for a fellowship God, um, uh, in the basement. We are going to take the dinner. Uh, help us to have a good time talking to one another and enjoying the dinner and help us to take the nourishment and live for your glory. We give you all glory and adoration. In the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, we pray.